use the jazz to spear. So, back to a more serious matter of discovering our history. So, let us dive straight in and take a close look at what academia has to offer us to substantiate historical claims of some of our greatest figures of the ancient world. These are the people who helped shape our view of society, who, in their writings and musings, gave us the very basis of what we call modern civilization. If you recall in my last episode, I spoke of how the intelligence services created false IDs, and to back those IDs up, they added a backstory, window dressing, and data, much like the so-called ancient manuscripts churned out by the monks of the 14th and 15th century. First, we have to take a moment to understand what I call the Great Reset, which I will be covering in a future episode. It was an easy job of the fakers and forgers to rewrite history as they saw it, immediately after what we call the Great Reset. But we must also consider the single most important drivers these people had at the time, which has not changed much in the centuries that followed, which is two drivers really, which was profit and power. I believe one of the driving forces behind all the fake artifacts, statues and artwork was just simple greed, and those who were adept at art and making fakes would consider two main factors. The first being, back up the church's narrative and you'll not be killed, and second, if you can produce an object that not only backs that kind of new learning, or as we have come to be told it was the Renaissance period, otherwise known as what I call the Industrial Revolution of Fakery, then your newly found artifact aged to perfection using various methods even known today would be worth a small fortune. The authorities, of the, time, the authorities of the time would not push too hard on you if it actually helped their own agenda. They were more likely to let it slide. As an example, from my own personal experience, I went to Petra a few years ago and was inundated with local traders in those great canyons with handfuls of Roman coins allegedly found at the site. And the same was true of Giza and Luxor. And in every case, they were fakes so the locals could earn a little money. This practice is as old as the sites themselves, and has been continued on a scale of grand proportions since the Great Reset. The Reset, by the way, is a period of time immediately prior to what we are told is the Dark Ages. With the idea of profit from fakes going back centuries, and the supporting artifacts of that claimed history, let's take a look at some examples. And please keep in mind as we traverse these historical objects two important factors. The first is the claimed date of the object's age, how old they claim to be, and the second and more important is when they were actually discovered. By that I mean, when was the very first verifiable evidence of the existence of such an object, or even manuscript, text, statue, it doesn't matter. So we're looking at the difference between age and discovery. Another detail I want you to take careful note of is the almost incessant use of the word copy. This alone should raise a red flag for many reasons. If, first, if the discovery of such artifacts was the first of its kind, how do we know it's a copy? Second, if the original has never been found or shown to anyone, what was it copied from? And third, using the term copy negates the possibility of using forensics to actually date the damn thing. And fourth, I might as well add it, it removes any accusations of fake since it's been stated that it's only a copy. You see how this works, the sneaky little artisans? Okay, so with that in mind, you will begin to see a cluster of data showing itself to be no more than mid-15th century. Prior to this, there were no records of any such items in written history. And if you think mention of such items by Plato and his Greek gang of philosophers is proof, remember, no writings of those people entered our historical consciousness until about the same period when their works were discovered or copied from older texts which no one has ever seen the originals of. Which, as I mentioned, forms part of the backstory in my last episode. A fake script to back a fake statue to back a fake narrative. You all by now know my opinions of the fairy tale land of facts better known as Wikipedia, which, for the purposes of this episode, will make things easier to use, since it's those so-called facts that are in one place that I can add my comments to, which is effectively being sold to us. It's both an example of what many take as fact, and of the ease at which we can question them all in one place. There's no need to put how bad Wiki is in the comments we all know, but without it, how could we know what keeps the masses asleep? We head over to Wiki to introduce you to the man who is responsible for much of what he sold as facts in the area we are to discuss in this episode, and he's also responsible, in case you didn't realise it, for most of the stuff that was discovered in history that gives our current modern civilization its basis. So let me introduce you to Poggio Brecciolini. Born in 1380, best known simply as Poggio, was an Italian scholar and early humanist. He was responsible for rediscovering and recovering a great number of classical Latin manuscripts, mostly decaying and forgotten in German, Swiss and French monastic libraries. His celebrated find was De Rerum Natura, the only surviving work by Lucretius. In October 1403, on high recommendations from Saluti and Leonardo Bruni, he entered the service of Cardinal Landolfo Mamaldo, Bishop of Bari, as his secretary, and a few months later he was invited to join the Chancery of Apostolic Briefs in the Roman Curia of Pope Boniface, thus embarking on 11 turbulent years which he served under four successive popes, first as a scriptor, which is a writer of official documents, and soon moving up to abbreviator, then scriptor, penitu, or scriptor, and scriptor of the apostolics under Martin IV. V. He reached at the top rank of his office 
as papal secretary, as he functioned as a personal attendant of the Pope, writing letters at his behest and dictation, with no formal registration of the briefs. In other words, he could write what he won, merely preserving copies. He was esteemed for his excellent Latin, his extraordinary beautiful book hand, and as occasional liaison with Florence, which involved him in legal and diplomatic work. He goes on to basically say that he was in the service of Rome and the Popes for many, many years, 50 years actually, throughout his long 50-year service, as you can see there. But what's interesting about this guy is this. Hoggio's search for manuscripts. After July 1415, and Antipope John the 23rd had been deposed of the Council of Constance and Rome, blah, 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 blah. The papal office remained vacant for two years, which gave Poggio some leisure time for his pursuit of manuscript hunting. And in the spring of 1416, Poggio visited the vast German spa of Baden and a long letter to Nicoli. He reported his discovery of the Epiurian lifestyle one year before finding the Lucretius manuscript. This guy was a real kind of um, Raiders of the Lost Ark manuscript finder, wasn't he? Where men and women bathed together, bared separately in minimum clothing. Oh my god. So he found this other manuscript. It goes on to say he found this manuscript. He found another manuscript. Thus, when he studies called him to the Council of Constantine, so he's back at the Pope, he employed his forced leisure to explore in the libraries of the Swiss abbeys. So he popped over to there as well. His great manuscript finds to date this period, and the treasures he bought the light. Above all, St. Gaul received from the dust and abandoned many lost masterpieces of Latin literature. This guy was literally responsible for the initiation of, oh, as you can see here, where he was influenced the future course of both the Renaissance and the Reformation, what epitomized in his activities and pursuits of this self-made man. This guy was responsible for churning out so many manuscripts that he claimed he had found that, strangely enough, the locals hadn't bothered to read in all the hundreds of years that were supposed to have been there. But remember, all of these manuscripts are now copies by this guy, which gave birth to the Renaissance and the Reformation period. He was also responsible, in a large part, to the revival of Latin and Greek. In the way many humanists of his time, Poggio rejected the vernacular Italian and always wrote only in Latin and translated works from Greek into that language. So again, he was in charge of a lot of the old text, but the revival of Latin Greek is absolutely huge. And so just to round off the character of this guy who was knocking out manuscripts and apparently finding them all over the place where locals could not, I just want to finish off on this, uh, this little bit here, which is, All the resources of Poggio's rich vocabulary of the most scurrilous Latin were employed to stain the characters of his target. Every imaginable crime was imputed to him and the most outrageous accusations proffered without any regard to plausibility, which is just another way of saying it was a complete pack of lies and he was really good at character assassination. Poggio's quarrels against Francesco Felicio and Niccolò Perotti pitted him against well-known scholars. So not only was this guy a prolific manuscript writer responsible for the revival of Latin Greek, the, the foundations of the Renaissance and the Reformations, but he had no problem in lying through his teeth in every imaginable crime against his competition, as it were, which I suppose, in essence, gives the mainstream media the basis of how they run their press nowadays, I guess. They might have read Poggio and thought, oh, we'll have some of that. Anyway, that's Poggio, let's move on. Now that we've had an introduction into yet another prolific medieval photocopy machine, we move from the writings over to some of the most famous busts of alleged antiquity. While the pen may be mightier than the sword, the artisan's chisel can sneak behind enemy lines. Let us take a look at the first of our stone mugshots and check the provenance of these characters. Our first stop is a very famous statue, which I'm sure you'll recognise, Venus de Milo. And a quick read on this is that it's an ancient Greek statue, and one of the most famous works of ancient Greek sculpture. Initially, it was attributed to the sculpture Praxiteles, but from an inscription that was on the plinth, the statue is thought to be the work of Alexandros of Antioch. It doesn't actually tell you what the inscription was. It was created sometime between 130 and 100 BC. How do we know? The statue is believed, it's not exactly, but believed to depict Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love and beauty. However, some scholars claim this is the sea goddess Aphrodite, venerated on uh, Minos. It is a marble sculpture slightly larger than life size, part of the arm the original plinth were lost. Now, so they've dated it to 130 and 100 BC. They're not quite sure who made it. They won't tell us what the inscription is on the plinth, but as I said in my opening statements, be very careful about the date of the statue itself, and if we look down here, it is generally asserted that the Venus de Milo was discovered on April the 8th, 1820. So prior to 1820, and it was discovered by a peasant named Yorgos Quintortas inside a buried niche within the ancient city ruins of Milos. Now, prior to 1820, this had never seen the light of day. So if we're talking about 130 to 100 BC, so over 2,000 years, look at that wonderful preservation after 2,000 years of being in the ground. So really, this came into our consciousness in the 1820s, irrespective of all of this stuff that's written up here and I'm going to be looking at a few more. So let's pop over to our next example. Our next example is the Disco Bolas, which is a very famous disc thrower, and it's going on to say, is a Greek sculpture completed at the start of the classical period, figuring a youthful ancient Greek athlete throwing discs, and they've dated it to around 460 to 450 BC. The original Greek bronze, oh look, the original is lost, but the work is known through numerous Roman 
copies. There's that word again. Both full scale ones made in marble, which was cheaper, and the first to be recovered. And it goes on to say, let me just put this into, here we go. Prior to this statue's discovery, the term discoverless had been applied in the 17th and 18th of all of this stuff that's written up here. And I'm going to be looking at a few more. So let's pop over to our next example. Our next example is the Disco Bolas, which is a very famous disc thrower. And it's going on to say, is a Greek sculpture completed at the start of the classical period, figuring a youthful ancient Greek athlete throwing discs, and they've dated it to around 460 to 450 BC. The original Greek bronze, oh look, the original is lost, but the work is known through numerous Roman copies. There's that word again. Both full-scale ones made in marble, which was cheaper, and the first to be recovered. And it goes on to say, let me just put this into, here we go. Prior to this statue's discovery, the term discolus had been applied in the 17th and 18th centuries to a standing figure holding a discus. This particular one, the first copy of this famous sculpture to have been discovered, was found in 1781. It is a first century AD copy of the original bronze. You see, you never ever find the original stuff. So really, this came into being at its earliest possible date of eight 1781 and it was supposed to have been dated to around about 460 to 400 BC but unfortunately the original doesn't exist and all we get now is copies which as I say 1781 we're going to try and go back as far as we can to the original source material which as far as I'm concerned is what we see not what we're told and see how far we get let's move on to another one to see if we can see the difference between the purported date that something was supposed to have been created and the date it was actually found for our next one we moved over to the winged victory of Samothrace the winged victory of Samothrace also called Nike of Samothrace is a marble holistic sculpture of Nike yet yeah, she was named after the famous trainers of victory it was created in about the 2nd century BC, but since 1884 it has been predominantly displayed at the Louvre and is one of the most celebrated sculptors in the world. But if you read further down, so they're pretty sure up here, because it says here, look, Hellenistic statues surviving in the original rather than Roman copies. Okay, so here's the date, but let's have a look. If it was a uh, surviving statue, the context of the winged victory of Samothrace discovered in 1863. So prior to 1863, this particular statue was nowhere to be seen. And the other question is, how do you know who it is? And I meant to say that on the previous one about the Venus de Milo. How do we know who that statue is of? Because it's just speculation. But if we read down the description further on this one, you'll notice that it contradicts what it's actually saying up here straight away. Ceramic evidence was discovered in recent excavation that revealed that the pedestal was set up about 200 BC, though some scholars still date it as early as 250 or as late as 180. Certainly the parallels with figures and drapery from the Permamon altar dated around 170 seem strong. The evidence for a Rodinian commission of the statue has been questioned. However, the closest classical parallel to the Nike of Samothrace are figures depicted on Macedonian coins. So in other words, they've used Macedonian coins to date it, which is is probably about as unscientific as you could possibly get. The most likely battle commemorated by this monument is perhaps, there's another what I call snide word, because it doesn't mean anything, perhaps the Battle of Kos, they're all guesses. So A, we don't know who it is, B, it only came into existence in 1863, and C, it contradicts exactly what they were saying up here. Let's move on to our next example. In this example, we jump over to another famous one that's sitting in the Vatican. Surprise, surprise, is Laocoon and his sons. The statue of Laocoon and his sons is all called the Laocoon Group, has been one of the most famous ancient sculptures ever since it was excavated in Rome in 1506. It goes on to say, uh, I'm not going to go through all the details, but Pliny attributes the work then in the palace of the Emperor Titus to three Greek sculptures, so three guys had a go at it, or he's just guessing at which one it might have been, but does not give a date or patron. In style, it is considered one of the finest examples of Hellenistic Baroque and certainly in the Greek tradition, but it is not known whether this is an original work or a copy of an earlier sculpture, probably in bronze or made for a Greek Roman commission. The view that it is an original work of the 2nd century BC now has few, if any, supporters. So it's not an original work, even though the first paragraph would have skip readers think it was. So in other words, we're looking at another copy. And the point is, these, these names, by the way, are completely made up. I mean, none of these statues that I'm showing you had names stamped on them whatsoever. So the, these are all fictions, all right? Straw men. They, they are not the names of these original people. These, these could be anybody. That could be Atlas, for all we know. It could be the guy that goes down the gym in your local street with a beard, for all you know. The point is, it, it's all fiction. And it only came into being, or into our, should I say, our consciousness, in 1506. So, and it's a copy. Again, let's move on to the next one. This one we all should recognize, Nefertiti Bust. is painted in stucco-coated limestone bust of Nefertiti, the great royal wife of the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten. The work is believed, not actually, it's just believed to have been crafted in 1345 BC. A look at the preservation of that. I mean, we're talking nearly 3,000 years old. Amazing. By the sculpture of Thutmose. Because it was found in his workshop. What do they have? The address in his street of ancient Egypt? How do they know? Anyway, it is one of the most copied works of ancient Egypt. Now, I'm not saying this is a copy, but we're going to get to that in a second. Owing to the work, Nefertiti has become one of the most famous women of the ancient world. She's a little bit Western looking to have been Egyptian, but that's just my opinion. 
A German archaeologist team led by Ludwig Broschart discovered the bust in 1912, so it only appeared in 1912 as opposed to 1345 BC, and it appeared in Tutmosis' workshop. Amazing! It just sat there for almost, what was that, 3,000 3, years on Tutmosis' workshop desk and like, boom, there it is, we just found it. Amazing. It's been kept at various locations in Germany since its discovery, including the cellar of a bank, blah 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 blah. What I want to bring to your attention is something else, allegations over its authenticity. The French language book, I'm not going to even bother, uh, by Swiss historian Henry Sterling and a book, Missing Link, in archaeology by Berlin author historian Ed Rogan, Eric Victan, both claimed that the Nefertiti bus was a modern fake. There's a surprise. It also claims may have, that Borchardt, who says he discovered it, may have created the bus to test ancient pigments, and that when the bus was admired by Prince Johann Georges of Saxony, Borchardt pretended it was genuine to avoid offending the prince. Sterling argues that the missing either bus would have been a sign of disrespect in ancient Egypt. Well, or could have been, but maybe he just hadn't finished it. No, no scientific records of the bust appear until 11 years after his supposed discovery, and while the paint pigments are ancient, the inner limestone core has never been dated. He suggests that Borchardt's wife, now that would make it more believable, modelled for the bus. Remember, as I said earlier, it's got a very Western look about it. That lady could be German, which would match perfectly. Look, she's got the, oh yeah, look at the jawline, look at the chin. That's German engineering for you. So you can see here, again, one of the most celebrated busts in history is already dodgy. It doesn't stop there. Let's just, I, I did actually find a site with lots of other depictions of Nefertiti from the medieval era, and for the love of me, I can't find where it is, but I can tell you now, she never looked anything like that according to medieval scripts and scribes. She, well, actually, she's quite ugly. Anyway, let's move on to our next one now that we've established, more or less, that Nefertiti didn't come into our consciousness until 1912, and it was probably another fake. Our next swap over is Diana of Versailles, and is slightly over the side marble statue of the Roman goddess Diana with a deer. We don't actually know this is Diana because, again, when it was discovered, there, there's no names attached to any of these statues, by the way. This is all conjecture on, on the part of academia, but let's move on. It is currently housed in Louvre. The statue is known by many names, and it is a Roman copy, another copy of the 1st century BC, of a lost Greek bronze original. God, they keep losing these things, don't they? Every single one I've shown you so far, they've, they've completely lost it. I mean, I, I don't know what's going on with these poor old Romans. Maybe they're suffering from Alzheimer's or something, you know that. Now, why did I walk into this temple again, that kind of thing. But anyway, so another lost one. It was discovered, the statue was discovered in Italy, the Louvre website suggests, so it doesn't know, but the website suggests it was discovered at the Temple of Diana, an ancient century, while other sources say that it was Hadrian's Villa in Tivoli. So in other words, they don't know where it was found, um, they don't actually give me a date that it was discovered, but it's got to be obviously pre-1556, which is when the Pope gave it to the King of France. So again, we're still looking at a medieval copy of something that is supported, uh, purported to be the 1st or 2nd century AD. And again, you're looking at the preservation of of this is absolutely amazing, considering that if we dropped something in the ground today and left it for 2,000 years, I assure you, there wouldn't be a lot left of it anyway. But let's move on to our next example. Our next example is the famous statue, as you can see here, called the Orator. Now, I hope some of my viewers now, and I'm sure you all are, are seeing a pattern here. Irrespective of the date attributed to these statues, they all seem to be found and rediscovered much, much later than where the attribution was. The statue called the Orator is also known by many names. The sculpture was made out of bronze during the late 2nd or early 1st century BCE and is an Etruscan work of art. Let's just carry on. The sculpture was found in 1566. Again, you see, so it comes into our consciousness in 1566. I suspect, and it is only a suspicion, but I suspect that while those monks, those Benedictine monks, were busy photocopying so-called original manuscripts and rewriting history, there was a whole bunch of other people just as artful as those monks creating these so-called ancient works of art. I can't say that for all of them, but it seems a bit suspicious that all of this stuff was found around the medieval time that these manuscripts were being knocked out. And who's to say, you know, it seems logical that the art was being knocked out at the same time. But let's carry on. So this was found in 1566 with the exact location being debated, so we don't know, but all sources agree, well I thought it was being debated, the sculpture was found either in or around Lake Trasimeno in the province of Puglia, or on the border between Umbra and Tuscany, 177 kilometers of Rome. So they don't really know where they found it, although look at it, they agree to disagree, and it wasn't coming into our consciousness again until 1566. So I'm going to finish on the statue side of things there, because every single one of them does have that pattern to it, which is, and I can fully understand that, well, yes, of course it's going to be discovered at a later date, but they're all copies of copies, and it seems suspicious that, as I said, those manuscripts are being knocked out, so the artworks would logically be the same thing, and there was a lot of money to be made in this as well. Let's move on. We, I think we've done enough on statues, so let's just move on. I think it is important to note that while discoveries of ancient artifacts are perfectly normal, what makes many discoveries suspect is the complete lack of unbroken lines of provenance of many of these major works. It would seem all we have is what was discovered rather than what has always been with us, and that in itself makes those discoveries questionable in my mind. And not forgetting the fact that they would earn the discoverer a lot of money at the time. 
But what really makes me question the provenance of these and many other discoveries is the fact that we have been led to believe that between the average years of 200 BC up to around the 16th century, almost nothing was added to the collective historical artworks or records, and that there was a gap of a thousand years, and then all of a sudden all these rediscoveries appeared as if some sort of archaeological renaissance had just taken place. The gap between the supposed creation of these works of art and their discoveries points directly at the period of time I call the Great Reset. The period of time when, in my opinion, humanity was in recovery of a cataclysmic event which I'll be looking at in a future episode. But I think the point here is not what or when these artifacts were discovered, but what the heck happened to history between these points in time. By the dates given to us, we are told to believe not much happened between the famed or fake Grecian epoch to the discoveries of the 15th century onwards. This would lend weight to Fomenko's chronology of history being a very accurate depiction. Now we've had a look at the recurring theme of archaeologists' assumed time of creation of these sculptors and the time of their discovery, we move into another aspect of this carnage of information we call history. We now take a look at the discovery and identification of some of the most famous busts of characters in our history and see if they too have the same questionable roots. We start our foray into the ID parade of history with one of the most famous of Julius Caesar, and we'll move on to others to see if this pattern of creation dates and discovery dates and how they were identified continues. So let's have a look at Julius first. So here we are on Tusculum Portrait. This is the bust of Caesar, Julius Caesar, upon which all other identification has been made. It's one of the two main portrait types of Julius Caesar, alongside the Cheramonte Caesar, being one of the copies, we're back to those copies again, of bronze originals, but we don't know where the original is again, they've lost it again, bit of Roman Alzheimer's creeping in again. The bust is dated to 4050 BC and is housed in the collection of Turin. The portrait's feeling, it goes on to say, the portrait was excavated by, Le oh look, Lucien Bonaparte, brother of Napoleon, at the Forum in 1825. So this didn't come in, this copy didn't appear until 18. 25. Now let's just have a quick look at Napoleon's brother here, and as you can see here, he was the brother of Napoleon Bonaparte. For me that's a red flag straight out of the, the box, but let's just have a quick look at him. I call this section, although they call it academia activities, I call this section, what are the odds? He was an amateur archaeologist establishing excavations at his property in Franscati, which produced a complete statue of Tiberius, and at Massignano, which rendered a bust of Juno. Bonaparte owned a parcel which had once formed part of Cicero's estate called Tusculum, and was much given to commenting on that fact. In 1825, Bonaparte excavated the so-called Tusculum portrait of Julius Caesar at the Forum. What are the odds, that's why I've called it that, what are the odds that this amateur archaeologist was establishing excavations in his property? In other words, he was digging in his backyard and he found a statue of Tiberius, a bust of Juno, and a bust of what is claimed to be Julius Caesar. And now how they identified that as being Julius Caesar, we shall now take a look at. So as you can see here, the portrait facial features are consistent with those on the coins struck. Really? Do they look like this portrait, this bust up here? They, they could actually be anyone, but let us let me not jump the gun. The portrait's features are consistent with the coin strike in Caesar's last year. The portrait was excavated by, as we know, Lucien Bonaparte in the Forum in 1825 and was later brought to the castle of the Agi, though it was not recognised as a bust of Caesar until Borda identified it in 1940. Okay, so it sat around for all that time and it wasn't identified in 1940. The portrait was exhibited at the Louvre alongside the Arles bust. There are three known copies, we're back to copies again, of the bust in Woburn Abbey and in private collections in Florence and Rome. So here are the coins that identified this guy as being this guy. And is there anything else here? Oh yeah. Above the denarii issued by Marcus Metius, these denarii we used to identify above bust with Julius Caesar. That's the poster here. So it's really? So we have two main busts of Julius Caesar, and these coins tie them all together. Let's take a look, and as he points out here, I mean, come on, it could be anybody. I totally agree with it. <laughs> oh, and as he says here, look, why not Napoleon? Yep, that could be a bust of Napoleon, for all we know. It looks pretty simple in actual fact. Could be his brother. Or, look at this one, Alexander the Great. So this is what I'm saying is that it's based on very dodgy ground. And to give you an even more sort of stark example of the identification of Julius Caesar, let's just take a look at what the medievals depicted Julius Caesar as, which is this guy here. And as you can see, if we scroll up, this is a medieval depiction of Julius Caesar long before that bust was found. And as you can see, even the monks, look at this, look, let me just bring that up. Does that look like a Roman emperor to you? But prior to 1825, that's what everybody thought Julius Caesar looked like. And now everybody thinks Julius Caesar looks like this. I mean, talk about changing your identity. This guy was a master at it. So there you have it, folks. Just to round off the claims of busts being found of Julius Caesar, I want to take a look at the latest claim of a bust of this famous character from history and see what they have to say before we move on to others you will easily recognize. Let's take a look at this. So as you can see here, great names in history. What did Caesar look like? This portrait bust of Julius Caesar has been found at the bottom of the Rhone River at Arles in France. And we read down, archeologists believe it was sculpted while he was still alive, perhaps two years before his assassination. Since it is clearly not an idealized portrait, but a study from life. The bust shows Caesar what he really looked like. And it goes on, I'm not gonna read all of this. There's experts like Mary Beard and Paul Zanka doubt that this bust represents Julius Caesar at all. One of the things that I instantly jumped on, and I'm sure you've already figured it out yourself, 
itself is that it was found at the bottom of a river. It was carved in his lifetime. So we're looking at approximately 2,000 years, and God knows how long this bust was bouncing around a fast-flowing river for all that time, and yet look at that. And I'm just about to show you some fantastic busts that have spent the same amount of time in a fast-flowing river of famous Roman emperors. Take a look at these. So as you can see here, this is a 3rd century bust found in the river at the bottom of my garden. It's of Constantine the Great, as you can clearly see, and the second one is of Augustus Caesar. And the last one you see here is a bust of the King of the Fairies, but unfortunately it's only a copy because we just can't find the original. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what a stone bust would look like swimming around a river for 2,000 years. Unless, of course, it was dropped in there a few days prior to discovery, or it was made of Roman titanium. Let's move on. Another quick trip into Augustus Caesar, ancient emperor of Rome. And it says here, you can quite clearly see what a lovely, beautiful work of art that is. But it says quite clearly here, artist, unknown, okay, but dated to the 1st century CE. Let's have a look, shall we? The first emperor of ancient Rome, the marble statue, stands 2.08 meters tall and weighs 1,000 kilograms. The statue was discovered on April 20th, 1863. So again, it was dug up in the 1863 year, owned by Augustus' third wife. How do they know? How do they know this stuff? Lever had retired to the villa after Augustus' death in 1814. Remember, artist unknown, carved by expert Greek sculptors. The statue is assumed to be a copy. Oh, there we go, copy again. But in here, I just want to bring your attention to this. Artist unknown? No, actually, it was a Greek sculptors. How do they know? And another copy of a lost bronze statue displayed in Rome. So they've lost another one. Those Romans completely lost it again. So that's another example. And you can see by now, this pattern is pretty consistent. It's not difficult to pick out the contradictions when falsehoods are being told. Nothing is ever watertight, and even truths can sometimes have a hard time surfacing through the muddy waters of fabricated history. But let's not blame just the Romans, let's move over to some of the most famous Greek legends from our not-history books. I'm going to take you on another small journey through the Parthenon of the Greek greats and see if we can establish how history establishes these characters and check to see if this pattern of creation discovery and the use of that cover story insurance word copy is mentioned liberally as reflected in the previous examples. And I think the saying, beware of Greeks bearing gifts, may be appropriate here, but let us see. Oh, and I'm going to introduce a heads up on what I call term snide words. And a snide word is a word or phrase used to cover one's butt and allow wiggle room for the alleged facts being given. So, let's start with one of the most famous ones, Homer. Oops, sorry, wrong one. Let's do that again. Homer. And for our next one, we turn to the British Museum. This is the famous bust of Homer, and we have nothing else to go on in terms of his name other than someone said it was. And this one was discovered, where are we, a copy? Here we go, Roman copy. Another copy of the Hellenistic original of the 2nd century. So again, we don't have the original, they lost it again, and its description goes on, a head of Homer ending in a terminus found in, and it was found in 1780. So again, we've got that late period of time as far as copying is concerned, and we've got someone saying that that's a bust of Homer, blind poet Homer, with Greek letters carved on each side, just the letters, I'm not sure how they spell Homer with just a couple of Greek letters, but it's got original and not Homer Simpson, I do apologise for that, I don't know how that got through. And just to finish up on Homer, we'll have a quick look at this because I think you need to. Homer, hailed as the poet of the Iliad and the Odyssey, the two great epics, wow yes we all remember those, which laid the foundation of Greek literature, has unfortunately come down to us just as a name. Remember, just as a name, not a real person, because in fact many modern scholars are not convinced that there was actually a man named Homer. According to them, these two epics were the works of a group of poet singers, collectively known as Homer. So it was the name of a choir then, rather than a, you know, or beatbox group or whatever, but another group however recognises that there was indeed a poet named Homer. I think nobody knows, but he had only refined the stories and compiled them into two epics. But it gets even more interesting, look at this. As Homer was born before the modern dating system was evolved, yeah, the manipulation of our chronology, it is very hard to pinpoint his birth year. However, it is certain that Homer lived sometime between the 12th and 8th centuries BC. How can that possibly be certain when they actually said we don't even if know the man existed? It's seeing more contradictions. But anyway, we move on. It needs to be remembered that this was a period when the people of ancient Greece did not have any script. Having lost the Mycenaean scripts, oh god, they're as bad as the Romans, they've lost them and all, and not yet acquiring the Phoenician alphabet. And since both the epics ascribed to Homer had been created in the oral tradition, experts believe Homer must have lived sometime in this period. In other words, Homer didn't actually write a damn thing. A, a yet another one. So, he didn't write anything down, but someone said that later on, hundreds of years after his birth, death, or even if he ever existed, someone else wrote it down. Although there is no hard evidence determining the exact year of his birth, okay. Then again, some modern scholars believe that Homer lived in the 12th century. It doesn't matter what they believe, there's no facts to this whatsoever, it's all guess 
best work. For example, Homer writes that see, see, I'm not even going to read it because, for example, Homer didn't write anything because Homer didn't exist and the bust didn't even say it's Homer's name and loads of people actually agree that it probably isn't Homer. So it's probably an old guy who had a bust made for him and all right, it looks like he's got a bit of a problem with his eyes but then that would be an advantage for the person doing the bust because he could say, yeah, that looks really cool, man. <laughs> yeah, and it looks like a complete pile of poo-poo. But Homer wouldn't have known that, would he? So anyway, I just want to tell you that Homer, again, is one of the most famous and yet may never actually have existed. And he certainly didn't write anything down. Just goes to show you, doesn't it? Let's move on to our next one. So we've arrived at one of the most famous Greek philosophers, Socrates, or as some people like to call him, Socrates. And he is credited as one of the founders of Western philosophy and as being the first moral philosopher of the Western ethical tradition of thought. An enigmatic figure, he made no writings and he's not- Whoa, let's just go back, sorry, he made no writings. So this bust, which is nameless again by the way, apart from the fact that someone's decided that's Socrates, and they weren't obviously around at the time to know that, but he made no writings and is known chiefly through the accounts of classical writers. Wow. Writing after his lifetime, particularly his students Plato and Xenophon. Okay. Other sources include contemporaneous, um, no, there's a whole list of them here, and it's the only major source to have written during his lifetime. Okay, Plato's dialogues are among the most comprehensive accounts of Socrates. Now, Plato was Socrates' student, so Socrates didn't actually write a damn thing down. So everything attributed to him comes from other people, and in this case, predominantly Plato. Let's move on. And as you can see here, it repeats that phrase that, as Socrates did not write down any of his teachings, secondary sources provide the only information on his life and thought. The sometimes contradictory nature of these sources is known as the Socratic problem. I've got a simple name for it. Lies. There you go. Or the Socratic question. Don't these academics make it sound so sort of convoluted when they just really want to say, we, we made it up? Now, the reason I'm saying that is that as we move down here, you can begin to realize what we're, or who, should I say, we're talking about. As for the discovery of a real life Socrates, the difficulty is that the ancient sources are mostly philosophical or dramatic texts, apart from Xenophon's. Now, what this is saying is that the character of Socrates was probably used as part of, as I presume Shakespeare would use in one of his plays, a character, that's all, who played devil's advocate within the Greek theatres. And there is absolutely nothing to say that Socrates actually existed apart from the writings after his death of Plato and a few others. And again, these statues were all obviously created hundreds, possibly thousands of years after Socrates himself. I could go on, but I think we've again proved the fact that all of this stuff here is second hand, and they admit, at least on this one, that this guy never even wrote anything down, and yet we put this Western philosophy at the first moral philosopher. Well, it's simply not true. And just a little bit more here on Socrates, just to round this guy off. The philosopher Socrates remains was in his lifetime an enigmatic, inscrutable individual who, despite having written nothing, is considered one of the most handful of philosophers who forever changed how philosophy itself was to be conceived. All our information about him is secondhand, and most of it vigorously disputed. But his trial and death at the hands of the Athenian democracy is nevertheless the founding myth of academic discipline of philosophy. It's a founding myth. So, you can see here, only goes on, so thorny is the difficulty of distinguishing the historical Socrates from the Socrates of the authors of the text in which he appears, and moreover, from the Socrates of scores of later interpreters, that the whole contested issue is generally referred to as the Socratic problem. How about they just made it all up, and I'm sure that he was just a character in the theatre. I mean, can you imagine, in a thousand years from now, some future archaeologist finds a digital recording of, I don't know, Avengers Assemble, and then swears blind that everybody on the planet at the time were all superheroes. I mean, this is basically what we're talking about here, it's ridiculous. So, I'm not going to go on uh, any more about Socrates, but what I'm going to do, because I thought it'd be interesting, is go down. So Socrates being the head huncher who probably didn't exist, and his student is Plato, and Plato's student is Aristotle. So I'm just going to hit those three as far as the Greeks are concerned and see what we come up with. And remember, Socrates comes into existence with Plato's writing, so I think it's only fair that we should have a look at Plato. Now remember, and it was Plato predominantly responsible for the work of Socrates, his teacher. Now first thing, again, let's have a look at the bust. So we've got a guy with a beard, much like the rest of them, and oh, that's another Roman copy of a portrait bust for academia in Athens. So we don't actually know whether that's Plato either at all. So it's, an, again, another unnamed bust, but we're going to call that Plato anyway, and it's not even original, it's another Roman copy. Those copies keep popping up all over the place. But let's have a look at Plato, and then we'll see just how credible this particular character from Greek history is. So, as it goes on, was an Athenian philosopher during the classical period in ancient Greece, founder of the Platonist school of thought and the academy, the first situation of high learning in the Western world. So that's, again, he's, he's got some serious influence. He is widely considered a pivotal figure in the history of ancient Greek and Western philosophy, along with his teacher, Socrates, and his most famous student, Aristotle, which we will get onto in a moment. Plato has also been cited as one of the founders of Western religion and spirituality. Now, for me, red flag comes up also, but I'll get to that in a second. And it goes on, I'm not going to cover all of this. Is, but one of the things I did want to pull out for you, if I can find it here, is this statement down on the bottom line. Plato's entire oeuvre is believed to have survived intact 
For over 2,400 years, at last, we've got an original source of text. Although their popularity has fluctuated over the years, the works of Plato have never been without readers since the time they were written. Oh, thank God. So they survived for over 2,400 years. Really? Let's have a look. So the credibility right off the bat is right at the beginning, which is his biography. And the first few <laughs> sentences, due to the lack of surviving accounts, little is known about Plato's early life and education. Plato belonged to an aristocratic and influential family according to a disputed tradition. So we're already disputing stuff, but that's not what I want to show you. What I want to actually show you is, and remember it, that um, it has survived intact for 2,400 years. Let's just move down to here. No one knows the exact order. No, sorry, here we go. History of Plato's Dialogues. This is the, the text that we're talking about that survived for 2,500 years, remember? 35 dialogues and 13 letters have traditionally been ascribed to Plato, traditionally been ascribed to Plato. That's one of those uh, words that we call snide comments because it gives you wiggle room. Traditionally been ascribed to doesn't mean say it was. So, though modern scholarship doubts the authenticity at least of some of these. Yeah. Plato's writings have been published in several fashions and has led to several conventions regarding the naming and referencing of Plato's text. So here we go with the copies. The usual system for making unique references to sections of text by Plato derives from a 16th century edition of Plato's works by Henricus Stephanus. Stephanus Pagination. We'll move to the chronology here. No one knows the exact order of Plato's dialogues were written in, nor the extent to which some might have later been revised and rewritten. So what happened to the 2400 years of unbroken line of the text? And I just want to finish up on Plato and that so-called 2,400 years of unbroken original text that they claim that they had by showing you this particular one from a website called sacredtext.com. And it says here that, where are we? So here we are. This is the particular paragraph I wanted you to take notice of. Plato died in 347 BCE. His works, and now this is the important bit, his works were saved for prosperity by Islamic scholars and reintroduced into the West in the Renaissance. Well, there's a coincidence. And remember, my favourite phrase for the Renaissance is industrialise copy. You know, and that... Is supposed to represent the unbroken line of 2,400 years, which clearly it is not. So I will leave you with Plato's influence on philosophy as well as natural and social science. I would go so far in this study to say Islamic scholars had influence on philosophy as well as natural and social science because there's no actual proof that these are originals and there's no actual proof that everything else wasn't copied and introduced in the Middle Ages again during the Renaissance period. So there you go, Plato, and that includes, remember, was all the textual information we also have on his teacher Socrates. I'll leave that there with Plato. Let's move on to Plato's student. Our final visit of the alleged great Greek philosophers is Aristotle, the student of Plato. And as you can see here, Aristotle, or Greek Aristotelis, born in 384 BC, died 322. Ancient Greek philosopher and scientist, one of the greatest intellectual figures of Western history. They've said that about all of them, by the way. He was the author of a philosophical and scientific system that became the framework and vehicle for both Christian scholarism and medieval Islamic philosophy. And I just want you to make a note of the Islamic connection again here, because it's going to come up in a second. Even after the intellectual revolutions of the Renaissance and the Reformation and the Enlightenment, Aristotelian concepts remain embedded in Western thinking. So that, I'm not going to go through all of this as far as Aristotle is concerned because they just prattle on about guesswork again as usual. But now I want you to take to what we know of all these wonderful works of philosophy from Aristotle. And here we are called the recovery of Aristotle. The recovery of Aris Aristotle refers to the copying or retranslation of most of Aristotle's books of ancient Greece from Greek or Arabic text into Latin during the Middle Ages. There we go again. That's that Renaissance, which is industrial photocopying time on my calendar of the Latin West. The recovery, I love that word, of Aristotle spanned about a hundred years from the middle of the 12th century into the 13th century and copied or translated over 42 books. So another word for we copied it all from an original which we can't find now is called recovery. Wonderful. Including Arabic texts and Arabic authors where the previous Latin versions had only two books in general categories. Translations have been due to several factors including limited techniques for copying books, lack of access to the Greek text, so the Greek didn't have access to their own text, and few people who could read ancient Greek. I see. So the Arabs could read ancient Greek, but the Greeks couldn't read ancient Greek. That's very interesting. While Arabic versions were more accessible, the recovery of Aristotle's text is considered a major period in medieval philosophy, not Greek or ancient Greek philosophy, but we're back to that period of time again where that Renaissance period keeps popping up with copies and all sorts of other manuscripts. Because some of Aristotle's newly translated views discounted the notions of a person of God, immortal soul, or creation, various leaders of the Catholic Church were inclined to censor these views for decades. Don't you think it's a bit of a coincidence that the Catholic Church was censoring the views and there was a previous Islamic connection as well with Plato's work, and now we have the same from Aristotle, as you'll see in a second. As it says here, in the early Middle Ages, some Muslim scholars had translated Aristotle's ancient Greek writings into the Arabic language. They had also written commentaries about those writings, so they actually wrote the commentaries. The preservation of ancient Greeks, Greek ideas was a major contribution of Islamic civilization. I personally think it was the other way round, but that's just my opinion. In the 4th century, the Roman grammarian Marcus Victorinius 
translated two of Aristotle's books about logic into Latin. A little over a century later, most of Aristotle's logical works, except perhaps the posterior analytics, had been translated, had entered into general circulation before the 12th century, so we are still a thousand years after Aristotle. We still don't have an original script here, by the way. The rest of Aristotle's works were eventually translated into Latin, but over 600 years later, from about the middle of the 12th century. So again, we do not have any original text. The first of the rest of logic works were finished by using translations on the Bothius as a basis. So in other words, what we know of Aristotle came from from the 12th and 13th centuries again. Although Plato had been Aristotle's teacher, most of Plato's writings were not translated into Latin until over 200 years after the recovery of Aristotle. So Aristotle's work became, uh, came first in around about the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries. In the Middle Ages, the only book of Plato in general circulation was the first part of the dialogue, Tiamas as a translation with commentary finally about 200 years after the rediscovery of Aristotle, after the rediscovery, so he was lost for over a thousand years in the wider Renaissance period, translated and commented on Plato's complete works. Copies of copies of copies, and you will see this time and time again. I just want to finish off the Aristotle side of things with identification again. Those busts that keep coming up, that the authorities or the, the academics say, yes, this is a bust of Aristotle. Let me just show you this for a second. So this is, a, we are told, is a bust of Aristotle. And we're also told that this is a bust of Aristotle. And we're also told that this is Aristotle. I mean, look how many faces this guy's got. Uh, or it could be this is Aristotle. Do you see what I'm saying here? And this is Aristotle. And this looks more like Caesar, Aristotle again, a line engraving. And it goes on, Aristotle. So we don't know what Aristotle looked like, or even if Aristotle ever existed, just like all of the other great Aristotle. Aristotle. Look, is this honestly the same guy? That's the one that everybody has come to say, that's, that's definitely Aristotle. That's Aristotle too, by the way, according to um, history. And oh, and so is this one. This is Aristotle too. So he had a man of a thousand faces just like the rest of them. Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, the whole lot. Nobody knows what these people look like, and yet we're sold that as an idea of history. And we've also found out, I hope, that you realise that all the writings of the Greek greats are copies of copies just like the busts and the Roman copies of sculptors and all of the busts we've seen. So it's a total fabrication from the early years, and there's still a 1,000 year gap. Let's get back. So what we have to understand is that none of these busts from Roman Caesar or images of the Greeks had any names attached to them when they were discovered over a thousand years after they were allegedly created in some 2,000 years. Not a single name, not one, nada. Not one name attached so they could be anyone as far as history is concerned, as far as we are concerned. Moreover, I believe we're looking at some sort of historical Truman Show and it is we who are all the true men and women and sh the show is history itself run by the deceitful directors. I find it questionable we keep revealing what could be seen as behind-the-scenes influence of the great thinkers of, the Isla of Islamic antiquity, having held many of the original texts according to what we've just read. The whole line of great Greek thinkers seems to be reliant on nothing but copied text, nameless busts, and more later translations, even though it's claimed in some areas an unbroken line of providence, which, as you've seen, is simply not true. Plato was able to create a Socrates of his own design according to his own interpretation and imagination. Plato brings into being a Socrates who says that writing is inhuman, pretending to establish outside the mind what in reality can only be in the mind. Nothing attributed to Socrates was ever written by him. Just ponder that while we wallow in all this speculative, historical, inglorious knowledge. As an additional request, before I conclude with two larger examples of historical Trumanism, well, I just think I invented a new word. Take a moment to consider the support which will allow myself and other channels to unshackle ourselves from the shadow banning of YouTube's algorithms by considering and comparing what we as creators bring you free of charge and what dross people are happy to pay for in streaming TV platforms that are mindless entertainment. It is subscribers and viewers like you that are the lifeblood of this channel. Even if only 10% of you viewers tip or just pay £1 a month or $1 per month via Patreon, I and channels like mine would not need to worry about any platform demonetization of our work and continue to bring you these videos. If you think my work is worth just $1 per month up against the content of pay-for content of YouTube, Netflix or Amazon, then click to support for less than the cup, cost of a cup of coffee. I guarantee you, any and all donations will go straight back into production along with the new educational platform I am scoping out which will make the established academic indoctrination look like a kindergarten for the uninformed. Well, at least think about it. Just one dollar per month. So let's move on and thanks for listening and now onto the, and now onto the final evidence and my conclusions. The first is one of my existing subscribers will know well, which is an image of Pompeii after the Allied forces bombed the heck out of it during the Second World War. And as you can see here, there's an awful lot of damage and not a lot left. This image you now see is what claims to be a restoration, and that is another one of those snide words used to denote a complete fabrication, complete with first century frescoes and fake frozen in time bodies. And for those of you who have not seen my episode History Gate, I strongly suggest you do and understand why these bodies are simply not what they claim to be, and those excavations you see there are staged images and are not actual excavations. Our second example is the tomb of Hatshepsut. 
The first image you see, taken from around the 1930s Egypt, and it clearly shows a ram with nothing but a pile of rubble at the foot of a hill. This is how it looks for tourists today. A very different site, complete with statues and hieroglyphs waiting to welcome all that tourist money. And here are some images I took while I was there back in 2009. And as you can see, the amount of reconstruction that has taken place from walls to statues to hieroglyphs, this reconstruction, in my opinion, has moved into the realms of a new construction and sold as ancient history. I understand the reasons for restoration and reconstruction, but there has to be a limit where we move from what was to what is clearly it is not. At the time of discovery, this was a pile of rubbish, and now it's a complete tomb. Yet another grand example of the invented Truman Show we are currently living in. In ending this episode, I'll give you one more of the most insidious attempts of the forgers to claim power over millions of people, and for that, we'll pop over to what we call the Donation of Constantine. So to, con so to conclude this episode, I want to introduce you to probably one of the biggest attempted fakes in history. Those of you who watched my previous video on called History Gate. I spoke of a bunch of monks who faked documents to steal land off another monastery, and they were the monks of Crowland in the UK, I believe. Well, this takes it to a whole new level. Let me just explain. The donation of Constantine is a forged Roman imperial decree by which the 4th century emperor Constantine the Great supposedly transferred authority over Rome and the western part of the Roman Empire to the Pope. Composed probably in the 8th century. I totally disagree, and they've used that snide word probably again. I think it's another medieval one. It was much later, but we'll continue. It was used especially in the 13th century. Yes, so we're a lot closer. In support of claims of political authority by the papacy, and Lorenzo Valla, an Italian Catholic priest and Renaissance humanist, is credited with first exposing the forgery with solid uh, philological arguments in 1439. Although the document's authenticity had been repeatedly contest contested since the year 1001, so for all my viewers, you'll know that is the year 1. In many of the existing manuscripts, handwritten copies of the document, including the oldest one, the document bears the title Constantium Domini Constantini Imperators. The donation of Constantine was included in the 9th century pseudo Isidorian Decratis collection. The text purportedly a decree of the Roman Emperor Constantine dated the 30th of March in a year mistakenly said to be both that of his fourth consulate, 315, and that of the consulate Gallianus in 317, contains a detailed profession of Christian faith and a recounting of how the emperor seeking to cure for his leprosy was converted and baptised by Pope Sylvester I. In gratitude, he... Constantine the Great, determined to bestow on the seat of Peter power and dignity of glory and vigour and honour imperial, and supremacy as well over the four principal seas, Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem and Constantinople, as also over all the churches of God in the whole earth. For upkeep of the church of St. Peter and that of St. Paul, he gave landed estates in Judea, Greece, Asia, Thrace, Africa and Italy, and the various islands. To Sylvester and his successors, he also granted imperial insignia and the tiara and the city of Rome and all the provinces, places and cities of Italy in the western regions. These guys were going for gold, weren't they? Basically, we cured you of leprosy and we're going to take everything that the Roman Empire has to offer. That is one hell of a forgery. I don't know who the forger was, but it sure gave the impression that the Vatican or the papacy at the time would basically own the planet. So we've gone from Crowland saying, we own the land that your monastery sits on, to the donation of Constantine by forgers, basically saying, um, this gives us legal precedence over the world. Um, so I'll leave you on that one just to set up the fact yet again that these forgeries throughout history are literally everywhere, not just art, but in these kind of documents, the busts, the frescoes of Pompeii. We are not living in a world we think we are living and we do not have a history we believe we have. Let me just conclude this episode. As historian and sociologist Rodney Stark eloquently puts it, Many historians argue that since absolute truth must always elude the historian's grasp, evidence is inevitably nothing but a biased selection of suspect facts. Worse yet, rather than dismissing the entire historical undertaking as impossible, these same people use their disdain for evidence as a license to propose all manner of politicised historical fantasies or appealing fictions on the grounds that these are just as true as any other account. It seems clear we are in the midst of a world which, at the very least, is reconstructed. A world that has been created by second-hand writings and teachings, and a world that is probably unrecognisable to our ancient ancestors. And if this is the case, and I am sure, like me, you think it is, let me pose the following. 
If we are the result of a history which has been written for us, then would it not be logical to assume it is we who in this day and age can also write our own? Can we not simply decide to say what is and what is not in our best interests? Looking into the past, one thing we can take from all this is the keyboard is mightier than the sword. And if enough people wish to make the changes we want to see, then why not take a leaf out of history's book and start to make them? Restore that future. Reconstruct the dreams you had in a world you wish to see. Back-engineer the vision that you have of a world you wish to live in and those of our children. I feel ours is a journey into the future that we can write here and now. For if we choose not to, then others will be left to write it for us. The future belongs to people which belongs to people who see possibilities before they become obvious to others. And it is my contention that you, my viewers, also see those possibilities. I hope you've enjoyed and found interesting this week's episode. And as I stated before, a single dollar subscription can help bring light into the dark ages we are living in and remove the threat of censorship from this and other channels. So, until next time, question everything, believe nothing, and stay curious. <laughs>